Matthias Seven seems like a Freiburg goes for the kill. He's going to pick it up. If just exists the match, he's going to win the round. There's no time. Oh, my God. Hello everyone, uh, we said we were going to do it, this is By The Numbers, a new CSGO show with me, Richard Lewis, and Thorin, who is contractually obliged to pretend that he's my friend now. Uh, it is sponsored That's by nice. Alpha, <laughs> it is sponsored by Alpha Draft, we've, <laughs> we've um, he, he called me a buddy my, in a tweet. You're my best Alpha Draft buddy, you know that? <laughs> 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 I'm glad. I'm, I, you know, I've wanted an Alpha Draft buddy for a long time. But as you can see, yes, it is. It is sponsored by Alpha Draft. They're a fantasy sports uh, website where you can, you know, pick players and for tournaments and uh, you know, like fantasy football, and you can earn money for doing it. Uh, and some of that money that they're giving to you, they're also giving to us to talk about Counter Strike, which is great. We we did it, Duncan. We sold out. Oh, well, that's why it's called by the numbers, you know, because <laughs> by the numbers that. Our downfall was created, and so here we are, Rich. It's, it's, well, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to uh, all the abuse I'm going to get on on Twitter. Now, we 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 did throw this sort of together. Uh, we we've been planning it a while, and then we weren't sure whether we were going to go live this week. So I need to say first of all that Duncan isn't in his usual home studio, so his internet might it's be choppy. Cool. He yeah, no cool. He's actually got heat, so he decided to go to Amsterdam. Uh, which I can't possibly think what he'd be doing out there. Just relaxing, getting my mind sort of loose, you know, unwinding from the hard, you know, plod of all those events, which just, just learning to become kind of one with myself in the world. <laughs> Good. Glad to hear it. Um, so look, uh, I, I guess we'll put, do a little bit of the show talking about Gfinity and then we'll get into the, the meat of it all. Um, we were there that this weekend. We did watch Fnatic rumble on to another title uh it was uh it, it was an interesting tournament overall but ultimately it kind of went the way we thought it was going to go which well all the way you thought it was going to go i i tipped envious uh to do well but they kind of went out in the group stage so i guess I mean, we should is, probably start with that hey here's the thing richard when you look at that tournament this is a great example of where People were a lot of fans have this problem I've noticed in esports where once the results happened, they think like, oh, that always had to happen. It could only have gone that way. Like that's sort of the right answer, you know. Like if you put these two teams together, you would always get this result. But actually, if you just look at the way that group stage played out, okay, yes, Envious lost to Virtus Pro and in kind of lackluster fashion. But the way they beat those other teams, like Titan and Cloud9, <coughs> I, I I wouldn't have been surprised to the playoffs if they beaten almost anyone else. And who knows, maybe even Virtus Pro had met them again. I think that they would have been very dangerous. It's just that the format happened to be not on their side the way it played out, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the one hand, you know, th th there is that. But I, I was really surprised at the way they lost to Virtus Pro. Like, to lose 2-0 to, to a team that you would imagine they would beat, like, nine times out of ten. Uh, oh, I, oh, I, and all they had to do was get a map, you know. It's not like you had to, you had, you had to win the two maps. You just get one map and you'd be home safe. Yeah, I was, uh, like you say, really surprised. What was interesting as well was the, the team's reaction to it. Uh, Shox was calling for that event. I think he took it really, really hard. Like, I saw him at the after party. We were sipping some champagne, I think it was. Okay. Uh, might, might, might not have been champagne. Might Probably have been wasn't lab. champagne, mate. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't tell the fucking difference. I'm, hopefully, with this alpha draft money, I'll be able to. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Moving forward, uh, but he that'll, said like, that'll be the name of our next show: sipping the champagne. Rich <laughs> we got all Lewis and <laughs> sponsored by Alpha Draft. Okay, we got a long way to go, I think, before we get to that. But he said like, oh, you know, I I, I was doing the calling, I was like laying out all the strats, Probably. so it's all it's all my fault. It's all my fault, he said, and uh, you know, he, he 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 was taking it really hard. I was like saying, nah, nah, it's all right, Shuxy, it's all right, mate. You can trust me. So, uh, so yeah, he, he, he was really down on it. I, I don't know how it's going to affect them going forward, whether or not they may think about moving back to having happy call like Fnatic did with, you know, Pronax was calling, then, oh, okay, Flusher has a go for an event. I feel like yeah. it has to be almost inevitable, you know. Like, to me, that sort of thing is like, 
It's, okay, it's like actually at the beginning of this team when they were all DLC, they did the same thing. They actually started out with NBK, and then after a week, it only took him a week of online games, and he was like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't do it, you know, and then they had Shox take over because he'd been calling an Epsilon. I feel like a lot of that stuff is like, it's like, okay, Virtus Pro do it on like a larger level. It's like when you have problems, but you don't want to change players, you just say, okay, let's try something new to, to spice things up, you know. And eventually, in the early period, it, it might even help a little bit because it might give your team a bit of a different look or you might be a bit unexpected. But I think eventually, as happened with Fnatic and as has happened with Virtus Pro again and again, where they go back to Taz, I reckon eventually you nearly always go back to whatever the ideal setup is, you know. Like after you, after the initial like honeymoon period doesn't work that great, I think they're going to have to go back to happy eventually because I think it's just the right choice, you know. It's, of all the players, he seems the one who's most, just most applicable as a leader, you know. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. I, I think as well, I, I've said this all the time, I don't know why uh, teams can't get their head around this. Like when Shocks, I don't know what it is, you know. He, he, let, let, we could say, I think you've called him this, a, a himbo, I think. Uh, did you call him that famously once? Or have I just made that up? I don't know what a himbo is. What is that? It's a male bimbo. Oh, you mean bimbo. like, a, like a, a, man mim, a male bimbo? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's true, yeah, he is. Yeah. He's sort of like that. Right, okay. So I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that because I've met the real Richard Papillon. Oh, okay. You know, the, it, we've had some deep philosophical conversations in our, in our many years uh, of knowing each other. But I think um, it's got to be said in terms of how he plays stylistically. If you say to him, like, oh, you're going to call or you need to absolutely do this one thing round after round, like Existence used to do when he was in very games, it never works. Shocks is uh, the kind of player that needs to feel things and he just needs to play completely divorced from, you know, any kind of expectation, any kind of plan. You know, like, I, as I've always said, famously, obviously, with it, what his surname means, you know, you don't cage the butterfly. You let it go and do its own thing. And I, I, I wonder if why the reason, because he, he didn't have a great uh, Gfinity, statistically speaking. I wonder if that's something that actually they need to think about moving forward. They should just give him a free role, let him play like a JW or something. Well, to, to give you a sports analogy, I know you like your football, Richard. Oh, I absolutely when, do. When, when I was a boy, the team that I used to follow was Liverpool, actually. And Shox is like one of those attacking midfielders where, yeah, you could literally just, if you had the best team, you could get him and just slot him right in central midfield and say, only hold here, you know, like pass up to the attackers but when what I always loved when I was a fan of Liverpool the reason I used to like to watch them play was they had like Steve McManaman and then later obviously they had Steven Gerrard and they, this is the whole concept is because these guys if you let them are brilliant playmakers but they're going to kind of do it outside of the concept of whatever like very strict tactics might be for other teams they, but they can create magic if you do it so it's more like getting the right sorts of players around them and then giving them a bit of freedom to, to create you know so I've always seen Shox as that sort of player I think if you if you give him that kind of role then he can just do things that you couldn't plan for that's why they'll be amazing as well it'll be so hard to read if you're the, if you're the enemy so it's hard to see though that we're, if how that kind of player can necessarily work as the in-game leader though because I'm trying to think in history you know, there's almost no way examples that I can think of where someone in CS who had that kind of role was also like a brilliant in-game leader who was like on the money all the time and really good calls. Yeah, I, d I can't really think of any examples actually. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. I, 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 I think like, you know, I've been looking at the numbers here because that's the show, right? That's what we need to do. We've got to, we've got to incorporate the word numbers uh, every 10 minutes. So we've, we've hit our obligation there. Uh, but um I want to talk about, just while we're here talking about uh, shocks, um, NBS have got to play Ninjas in Pajamas in the next uh, play week in ES yep. ESL, ESEA's Pro League. Now, Nip are kind of a little bit all over the place, and we'll talk about them at, at the minute. But, I mean, if you were to, like, if you were doing a draft and you wanted to put some NBS uh, players in, who, who would you say statistically you should go for? Because, you know, I'm looking at shocks, it's, uh, his numbers are okay, but I mean they're they're not what we're used to from him, even in this online capacity. And NBK actually hasn't been doing too well either. So who's really stood out for you in terms of you know if, if you were drafting someone into a team, who would you want to pay the big salary for? I mean, I think he's the best player at the moment in their team. I think it's probably going to be Kiyoshima, especially because the thing is, his playing style is like so explosive in all areas of the game. He's so good on the save rounds. He's so good working with like a half buy that I think he's always a threat to get kills. And it's true. If you are very aggressive, you might also every now and then have a really bad game. But just his playing style, how good they are as a team, I think he statistically, he's always going to be up there as one of the better players. So for that, it more just depends 
within your draft what are you going to assign to that player you know because i would assume he, he probably has pretty decent numbers yeah i mean it's it's interesting actually so looking <coughs> at the i've got the stats for the whole team up here uh in the online play like shocks has a kda of 1.7 so not as bad as i thought it would be uh that puts him kind of level with like guys like biali and 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 whatnot uh which is which is interesting but um, yeah, it's still not what we usually associate with him as being a mad fragger. Again, to put it in context, although I think they've played less games, Guardian sat on like 3.0 as a KDA. So, sure. I mean, Shocks, Shocks is kind of a little bit behind that. Happy's on like 1.3. It's MBK that's really lagging behind everyone else, 0 0.9. So, uh, Envious, uh, you know, kind of, you know... Not really, not really found vintage form at the moment, and it's really weird. Ever since you put them number one in your top ten ranking, you you basically fucked them. I mean, that's it. Like the no, they're, what's they're, funny they're, is that fam famously, Rich, the two times I put them number one, they were two, number one in two of the rankings. Immediately after that, they failed to make the final of each of the next tournament and immediately yeah. dropped out. So yeah, I d I think that just kind of talks to their team though, because the thing is, their team is so good, and yet. Yeah. The problem they have, I think, is they, they just because of the nature of how they play, their playing style, they're not a super tactical team, and they do play a lot of how incredibly skilled the lineup is. I feel as though, as a, as a result, they're not going to be as consistent with like winning tournaments. And so they, they're the team that need like the hot streak of form. Now, it doesn't look like it because they're so good, they nearly always get to top four anyway. But in general, they're not the team that's just going to be able to win like three tournaments in a row usually. So as a result, it's going to be hard to get the number one ranking. But... They're obviously very, very good still. I like. I don't. I don't think that last tournament was like the end. You know, the fall of Envious, and now they'll be like the fifth best team or something. I think it was just one bad tournament, and and plus a different format to usual. Like in any other format, it's almost impossible they would have missed the playoffs. You know. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the game against Ninjas in Pajamas, and to do that, we'll sort of frame it from the context of how Ninjas in Pajamas played at G Finity. I thought Ninjas in Pajamas, you know, like on day in the, in the early group stages, I was like, wow, they're getting back to where they need to be. They're, you know, betting in Alu quite well. Forrest put the team on his back. He was, was playing incredibly well, which we haven't been able to say for probably he's over two months now. Um, yeah, yeah. He's been... Yeah, he's been one of the poorer players in, in the lineup, but I mean, statistically speaking... And he's literally speaking, only had, like, the odd map. Like, not even yeah. a tournament in the past where he was doing well. He he would have a map, and you'd be like, oh, is he back? But he wasn't, you know. And this time, yeah. it looked like he... Yeah, he looked like he was pretty locked in. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, because him and Get Right have been the foundation in Ninjas in Pajamas. Right now, Get Right still remains one of the most horrifyingly consistent players. Oh, he's nuts. Yeah, it, it's ridiculous. Like the, the 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 prospect of having to play against him is, I, I just wouldn't envy that at all. The thing uh, is, though, what, what, what was so shocking at this last tournament was in the games you're talking about where Forrest was going nuts and it's like, oh, maybe we're getting the old lineup back together. Then bizarrely, it was Alu who seemed to struggle, and he's the guy where he, he's the one person I could rely on at all times in the other team. You know, like even when Get Right was getting back in a form, as soon as Alu came into the team, he was almost immediately like top fragging, always getting yep. his kills, and so when he dropped off. That, I mean, if I was Nip, I'd be really frustrated now because it's like, well, what, what are the answers here? Because that, that he was one of the answers. We brought him in. He's really consistent. Now we're looking at the others. Like, let's get them back in a position. Like, we know we've still got some good parts here. Maybe we need to switch a roll up. Because he saw them switching a lot of CT sides. But if Alu, I don't know if that was a one-off from him. But if, if he has any yeah. kind of drop in form, I'd be really worried for them, you know. Yeah, I mean, that definitely didn't work on Dust too, where, uh, you know, having get right hold short. And that's a waste of what he's good at anyway, you know, whereas it, it was working fine when Ali was doing it. So I have no idea why they changed that. Yeah, I thought Ali was sick at that position. Yeah, but he, he, he really is, you know, or hold it, holding it with an AWP. He can look both ways. He can check long. You know, it just worked. He was, he was just so good at it. So I have no idea why they decided uh, to change that up. I don't know if it was to maybe sort of ease the burden on some of the other players that haven't been playing well lately. I think to, to that end, and I, I didn't think I'd ever do this, but I'm going to have to kind of go in a little bit on Freiburg. It's awful, isn't it? To have to, to well, not the image, but uh, to have to do it to somebody that, yeah, you know, he was like a linchpin when Ninjas in Pajamas were super successful. Like, yep. you know, the, the King of Banana, the great Henry Fragger. Just lately, his numbers have been really, really poor. I mean, I think, Somebody said for Gfinity, his uh, KDA was something like 0 0.45 or something. 
I heard some, I, I mean, I saw some of the stats for some of the games and they were really bad. Like, it's yeah. not, like, here's the thing. Normally, if Freiburg has bad numbers, it's because the team had bad numbers. Like, they lost the game. It wasn't convincing, you know. But he was having bad numbers, as we're talking about here, in games where some of his teammates were doing well. So I, I can see why. I mean, I think he made a tweet after the tournament, like, he'd never felt this bad ever. Or he, like, it felt, I think, like, maybe he felt powerless or something thing and the reason why is because I, I bet he himself feels like I, you know I let the team down this time like I'm showing sure the I mean I get the sense of all the players they don't have a lot of them like this okay who are like taskmasters but I always thought within their team it's mainly like exist in Freiburg are the guys who try to like hold people accountable you know like you have to do this part of your job so the problem is if a player like that stumbles himself now he has to question his own like confidence you know which is maybe what the rest of the team were basing theirs on yeah, well, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that, and I, I've seen, you know, uh, Adam after these events. Like he, w when they lose, he's really, he's always nursing his drink, looks really down. You know, he's very emotionally invested in winning. So yeah, I, I think there is a lot of pressure on him right now, uh, and and the pressure that he's putting on himself to kind of get back to his old level. He's definitely a factor in why Nip aren't really performing right now, and you know, uh, they showed. Again, what you know, I keep using this phrase: uh, signs of life against Fnatic. You know, they really that series that Nip and Fnatic had was so close; it was on a knife edge. Really, could have gone either way, and uh, you know, it ended as a draw. Um, but it could have easily been two zero to either teams. If you're competing on that level with Fnatic, then it's not all bad. But again, I I feel that Nip is still some distance off getting back to their level. I mean, okay, I'll put you in a hypothetical here, Duncan. You come in, right, you've been appointed manager of NIP. Yeah. Complete autonomy. Uh, you know, Natu's out the picture, no one there to influence your decisions. What do you do? Uh, the thing is, here's the problem. I feel. This is why I think actually a lot of people think I'm so harsh on NIP. Is because actually, here's what's funny. Here's something me and NIP fans, hardcore NIP fans have in common. We expect NIP to win tournaments. They're not supposed to just be a good team, okay? It's not acceptable for Nip to be like the old TSM before they won. Like, oh, always an elite, always a top team, you know, always have a chance to, but then you just fail at last minute. You're like, oh, well, I guess, you know, they're better than us or we have something to figure out. If you're Nip, it's, as harsh as it sounds, it's like being a Manchester United. Really, only championship-type titles are an acceptable metric for you. So if I'm going from that point of view, I can't just make them like a slightly better team now. I have to try and make them the number one team again. And I think that with some of the pieces they have, that's still possible. Now, their problem for them is who do, who do we bring in? Like, that would be the part where I'd have issues because I've heard some of the names maybe they tried to get in the past where some of those players now are in better teams or are in better situations, so maybe it wouldn't be possible. But I would probably do a roster move. Like I'm, that's the thing, though. I'm not entirely sure which player I'd pick at the moment because, to me, the obvious pick before actually would have been Forrest, believe it or not, because he mm. he'd had a sustained period of doing badly. Alu and Getright are both doing really well consistently for me. Like, like actually, with Alu's pro recent problems, get, I assume Getright's probably the, the statistical best player in the team. You know, so he's probably the guy oh, I would yeah. pick for yeah, that. But so okay, Alu and Getright. So I'm going to be build my team around, and then since in the past. Freeburg didn't used to have these issues before. So to me, the two that always had to be considered on the chopping block was Exist and Forrest. And it might sound crazy to put Exist up because he's the in-game leader, but I have noticed just their style of play. I think they could probably get away with another in-game leader if the rest of the team was good enough. So to me, I would probably, I would have probably gone to Forrest, I think, just because also if you're going to look for someone who's just, uh, if we're going to bring someone into NIP, so they're not going to be super experienced maybe, or they're not going to have played at the elite level, I'd actually rather just have a fragger, you know, rather than try and bring someone in who's going to do some complicated team play role, or we have to have some a special synergy. I think it's a lot easier if you just bring someone in who's got some fragging ability and kind of say, like, go to work, and we'll kind of adapt around you, and we'll bring you into the fold that way. So I would probably, as, as, as much as it might sound like heresy for the context of his career, I'd probably consider Forrest, or I'd even ask him, like, you know, if I was going to be the general manager, I'd probably ask a hard question like, listen, how long will this continue for? Like, as a pro player, do you just want to play until your career is done? Are you going to play forever? <clears throat> are you are you someone where you have a, a standard you have to hold yourself to? Because if so, maybe you have to decide a period of time. Like, if things haven't improved by now, I'll retire. So I, I actually think, believe it or not, if they want to do what I say, that the real level of be a world champion again, they probably have to change a player. Because looking at it now, even if they had an even better tournament than we've seen so far and they won a tournament, it would feel a bit like a one-off. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel like, I, like, you know, when TSM won that PGL, we were all really yeah. thinking, right, hey, maybe TSM's the new top team. And maybe they are. They've only been to two tournaments. They won them both. But if Nip were to have won this last tournament, even Gfinity, I actually probably wouldn't have felt like that. I'd feel like, okay, maybe they just had the best possible day. 
Like when I look at the team, it doesn't really look like a world championship team right now. What do you think? Um, <laughs> I, I kind of, I kind of agree with you, but equally, I think part of it is, you know, it, it's really hard to shine quite so brightly when everyone else around you has also got their own sort of, you know, luminescence, if you like. Uh, it, it's, it's the difference with this era compared to the era when Nip came up. It's day and night. You know, t teams are capable of beating each other. They're getting better all the time. And I, I, I feel almost as if Nip are kind of, again, a use a football analogy. I, I, I think they're almost like that Liverpool. You know, they've got these, uh, you know, they had these players which were just head and shoulders above everyone else for the longest period of time. Winning titles came at a canter. It was just so easy. But now we're in that transitional phase where maybe some players have one eye on retirement. Everyone else around them's got better. You know, they've set the standard that everyone else is aspiring to get to. And, and teams are getting there, right? So... Yeah, it, it's 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 hard for me to say. You know, I, I don't. I I kind of agree that they need to freshen something up. But um... like to give you an analogy, okay, we come we come from League of Legends. Like we're also working in League of Legends, so we've seen what happened with Cloud Nine recently. Like yeah, yeah. if you think about it, it's a similar problem there, where because you had this special lineup and they they got along so well, it was almost considered like taboo to talk about roster cuts. Like people would be kind of be like, oh, you couldn't do that. And so unfortunately, what that means is you place kind of like a a crazy premium on the idea that whatever we do can never be cutting one of these special players. But as you th so to continue the analogy in Cloud Nine now, okay, they've had to cut actually one of the core players of their team, like a very special player who who even even maybe helped define their style. But even though they haven't played yet in League of Legends. They've got this young talent who everyone individually was very excited about. And now think about how you think of that team. Okay, they might end up doing worse, but at least at the moment, you can now kind of mentally put them on a plane where it's possible they could do much better though. Like now you actually feel like, hey, maybe they could, maybe this totally transforms and maybe they do become this great team in League of Legends that could even win a championship. So in, in CS terms, I, I realize how hard it would be to remove someone because it, they have been such a core part. And that was maybe that even is part of that whole like nip magic thing, which I don't say jokingly, like they have a special chemistry around them, you know. But yeah. if you were to bring in a player, like I'm saying, it's hard to know who, but if you brought in a skilled player who had a different, who right now is in his prime, okay, we're not waiting for him to get back into his prime or figure something out. A player right now who's very skilled, imagine the potential upside, imagine the things that could get better. Mm. Yeah, I, I I definitely agree. I mean, like, so let's uh, let let's think. I mean, you know, I'm looking at the online numbers while 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 you're talking about it, and it's like actually, you you would think there isn't really uh, a problem if you were to just look at some of the results they've had in isolation. Like, for example, they beat TSM in this ES, ESL Pro League, uh, which is you know that's 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 a fantastic result. I mean, uh, yeah, there's, yeah. there's an argument I would say right now that maybe. Maybe we can consider TSM if they can win one more tournament or have a sustained run of results. There's an argument you can make about them being the second uh, best team in the world. I mean, I, I think that's there's certainly there. a cost for it. Yeah, yeah, got the potential. I, um, so I, I think that's a great result for them. And I've just been quickly going through the numbers. Uh, probably won't surprise you actually that statistically, based on just the games they've played in, well, this one game, it was again Freiburg that was at the bottom. By, by 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 quite some distance with a, with a negative scoreline, um, so he's he only earned twelve points in total uh, for for anyone who had him in their draft team. And again, if you compare that to some of the other teams that are in there, I mean, twelve is pretty poor. Like, I'm just looking at the overall list. Like there are some Penta players below him. Uh, Paradox, a couple of flip side players, but he's right down there. You know, obviously it's not a yeah, big sample not a good company, by any yeah. means. But but you know, if you think about it in, in terms of how he played at Gfinity, how they played at recent LAN events, he wasn't exactly amazing at PGL, for example. Um, it, it, it's really Freiburg that's standing out as a player that's having a really poor run of form. Uh, and again, it, it gives me no pleasure to highlight that whatsoever. Um, just to bring it back to the league, because already we've dedicated like. Uh, over a quarter of the show are just talking about these two teams uh, within the context of Gfinity. I knew there was no way we were going to be able to do an hour at all. It was it was crazy. We, we might need to expand it a little bit. But uh, how, how, what do you think that means in terms of that result then? So when Envious are going to come up against Ninjas in Pajamas, you know, how do you see that one going? That's going to be played on Monday the 25th. 
Here's the worrying thing if you're an envious fan is that it's not like they've never had issues offline with certain teams or they've lost time and they've even had p- poor performances. But the difference is in the past, I've seen times where they got utterly smashed. Like they got smashed by Nip in the semis of Katowice. They used to get smashed by Fnatic regularly offline when Fnatic first became really good. The difference was the one thing you could always rely on is that envious was kind of like TSM. They were always amazing online. Like online, I think they were at one point in time, they were the best team. They were even beating Fnatic back when Fnatic had their number offline. So the the, the worrying thing is that <clears throat> their poor performances started online, actually. It began just before PGL. They were losing all these matches coming into PGL. Then at PGL, obviously, they finished in last place. And then going beyond that, now we've had these other results where, okay, yeah, second place at Dream Actors is nothing to, like, turn your nose up at. That's a good result. But then getting beaten kind of unconvincingly by Fnatic in the final there. So actually, I feel like in general, the team really isn't in a downward swing. Like, I, I don't like to assign too much to it when it's one or the other. Like, you're bad offline, or good online, good online, bad offline. But at the moment, it seems like it's both. And and when we add in all these things we're hearing about, oh, uh, who's going to be the in-game leader and we're busy moving into our team house or something, like, there's, it sounds like this is a team that's, uh, for the first time, is a bit out of sorts, you know. I'm not sure they know what's going on, but it seems, it seems like morale's not that high in their camp at the moment. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's probably just something transitional. Um, and again, it's interesting in that sense. They're sort of a good match right now, stylistically for Nip that are going through a, a transitional phase of their own, a very different one, but but still still uh, a transitional phase. Uh, just if this adds any weight to the prediction, the map that they're going to play will be Cobblestone. I don't know if uh, you've got any particular feelings about that. How it, if it favors one team or the other. Hmm. I mean, we have even seen the two teams play it before. I think they played it at Gfinity. I think that might have been one of the maps. And yeah. that, obviously at that point in time, that was back when Envious was, was beating Nip regularly and it was like they kind of were their kryptonite, you know. I would I would still expect that map to favor the Envious guys. But like actually, if, what's funny is if I look between the two teams, as much as we're talking about like problems in NIP, et cetera, I think they're probably around the same level, the two teams at the moment. So it should even be a fairly evenly matched. I mean, like you're, like you're kind of suggesting here, it's not like a map that either is famous for. So I think adding all these factors, it should be reasonably close between the two. I agree with what you said. out there. a couple of matches went that well, but what people didn't notice about Gfini because they went out early is that actually Happy had some insane stats. Like I saw some stats where like he was like first of all players in the group with like plus six X, even though his team went out of the tournament. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with Happy still. I'm sure he's still great value for me in terms of picking up on a team because he's another guy like a get right where you just don't know they're going to get their numbers. I mean, they're still a play does favorite, but get a certain amount of frags. Okay, so wrong pick, good bet. So apparently Duncan's just had to drop. Um, I'm I'm getting little bits of him coming through. I don't know if you can hear this, guys, but he's still sort of cutting in and out. So, uh, you know, it's the first show. He's in Amsterdam, wrecked out of his mind. I'm here in the UK with our far superior internet to the uh, to the Dutch hotels. So I'll, I'll just carry on until he uh, comes back. Now, the other games that we've got going on uh, just in EU before we switch to NA is going to be uh, Virtus Pro have, I think this result's just come in, actually. I'll just double check. Yeah, Virtus Pro have just beat Penta 16-10 on Inferno, which isn't a huge surprise. The new look uh, Penta team that's competing in this league, I'm not really feeling it as a team at all. 
Am uh, I back? Ah, uh, here he is. Here he is. Okay. Here he is. Yeah, you are back. Yeah, well, that, well, what you're mentioning here actually is is an, a story that kind of went under the radar purely just because of kind of news fatigue. Because if you remember, the NA shuffle happened. And that yep. was like so, so many weeks of like rumors and stuff that people didn't notice that there actually was a legit German shuffle where like almost all of the Penta players left, went to make a mouse sports team. And then instead into Penta, they brought in a bunch of people who used to be in like alternate attacks and some of the old Penta players. And so actually Penta now, that's why I took them out of my rankings, because even though they have the yep. name, they have almost none of the players who got those recent results, like top eight of the major and stuff. So I'm interested to see at the moment w even which of those German teams will end up being the best, because obviously Pentra are the one with the name that we'd follow, but Maus have some of their players. So it'll be interesting to see, because the German scene has lacked for a, a really good team in quite a while. Well, Pentra are <coughs> rock bottom of the EU group at the moment. Uh, you would expect that, though, with who's in the in the league. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It, it's really hard for me to sort of say which way it's going to go and i agree it's kind of you know got, gone a little bit under the radar but i think it's safe to say the days of penta who it, i don't even know why this has happened actually i just want to go on the record and say one of the great things that were happening was this penta team the progression they were making together collectively as a unit you know we talked about vox eminor uh from australia the progression they'd made just by staying together going to events you know working things out we first time we saw Penta, you know, it was really underwhelming. Then they went to uh, DreamHack where they got out of the groups and everyone was like, wow, like, okay, that's an achievement in and of itself. They did incredibly well at the Ace Race Split Invitational, at the uh, Asus Republic uh, of Gamers Winter uh, Invitational. They beat Virtus Pro um, oh, yeah. and put, put, them out, put, put them out the tournament for a top four finish. So now you're like, okay, this team really is going places. And now they just change it. I have no idea why that's been allowed to happen because that that was actually the team that was going to be, if, if anyone was going to fly the flag for Germany in CSGO, it was going to be that Penta lineup. You know, sure, that's you could have maybe made they one had or two tweaks. Like, it feels like they were a team that was a bit too quick on the trigger in terms of roster moves. Like, they, if you're having good results like that, you've got to still test the waters a bit, you know. And, and you're, you're listing the lands they've been to here, but that's, like, only lands they've been to. They've been in a couple of majors and then a couple of smaller tournaments. Unfortunately, they weren't going to, like, the DreamHack, Gfinity, these events where we could have got a better sense for how good they were. And so what happened with those teams is every time they'd have a positive result, they'd make some sort of a roster move. And so, actually, the best one they'd made was they'd brought in Trouble, who'd been doing quite well. Both of them just before the last major, Katowice, and they'd made it to the round of eight there, and they actually took a map. I think they, no, oh no, they lost 2 0. I think they, had, I think they had to play for Fnatic actually, so fair play. They lost 2 0 there, but they made it out of the group again at another major. And yeah, that's the issue for them is that they keep, they keep making these roster moves. And then afterwards, even though they'd done quite well, they kicked the troubly guy out and they got someone else in. So I feel like their team, maybe they were just too eager for the results, you know, like actually you've got to kind of let it, let it see if it can progress. Like you're describing here where you're actually improving event upon event. You can't always just do roster moves. So I, I'm not, I'm not as surprised that this is fra fractured apart though. I am in the sense that so much of the team's just left and gone somewhere else. Now, maybe that's going back to sort of like, to me and you, Mouse Sports isn't that big an organization anymore, but I'm sure in Germany, it's still, it's still kind of got a place in people's hearts. It's like, that should be the best organization. Oh, definitely. And hey, maybe they can offer the most. So maybe Mouse Sports is making a power play here to have the best German team. Yeah, well, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I, I, I think they absolutely need that. You know, I, I couldn't think of, you know, now that MTW aren't really uh, <laughs> a factor, you know, M Mouse Sports is the one. And of course, in 1.6, MTW's famous team, were the with the Danes, so they didn't even really represent Germany all that yep. much anyway. Yep. Uh, but yeah, Mouse Sports is the d definitive German organization in a lot of ways, and uh, it is sad to see them languishing and not really catching up to speed in CS:GO. I, I hope they can, but still, the disastrous uh, you know series of changes for Penta pretty much killed them stone dead. And, and, and when again, you're talking here about Penta, the thing is, the world uh, when if this league had begun three months ago. I'd be like, okay, hey, maybe they can fight for like, maybe they're like a sixth or seventh team if things go well. But you look at the teams who are in the ESEL, ESEA Pro League, obviously these are just the best teams. There's almost no team in there that's missing in terms of good teams. So the problem they have, I feel, is a lot of the bottom teams have actually improved a little bit since this league kind of began. Like flip side, Simple's going crazy at the moment. He's playing incredible CS. Even Hellraisers, who when they picked up this complete unknown, I, I didn't expect much from them. 
They've had this top four dream high. It seems like they've improved a little bit. It actually has been a good pickup. Almost all Dignitas is obviously a great example because they'd been having terrible results. Now they had a, a, a top four finish at DreamHack Tours, took Envious close. They're having good results online here. So their problem as well is, even if their level hadn't have changed, the, unfortunately the people who were their peers, it felt like were, were moving up a bit faster than them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the person I feel sorry for in all of this really is Crystal who I, I felt was on course to really establish himself as one of the premier orpers in that Penta side. Sure, a lot of the things they did tactically were about making him look good, were about putting him in the position where he could shine. But if, now I just I look at that lineup and I just don't see that happening. I, you know, I don't see who's going to really give him that platform. Like There's so much extra pressure on him now uh, to, to, to carry. And uh, I just think it's a shame because... Again, looking at the numbers, uh, he's he's really struggling in this league right now. Um, you know, this is this is a guy who was like carrying. Uh, oh, he was always the, the standout in their team. Yeah, yeah. And, and always, now, if, even if they couldn't win over big teams, he'd always have a good performance. You know, he'd have the, he'd have exactly. the good numbers that tempted you that he could be a good player in the future. Well, in the games that he's played so far, just looking at this, he's had a zero point four KDA and a zero point eight KDA. So, again, really, really struggling uh, to find some semblance of form. And currently, I mean, you know, if, if anyone was going to try and bring a player in on the cheap into their fantasy draft who would usually post big numbers and might get a cheap salary out of it, Crystal's a guy you would look at, but not anymore, I don't think. Not anymore in that Penta side who look absolutely destined for rock bottom, uh, as I see it. Um, right, so... Next point. Actually, it gets worse for Penta. I'm just looking at the results. Uh, sorry, the, the fixtures. They've got TSM tonight, like, coming up. So they don't even get a break. I mean, like, that feels gonna... almost impossible, you know. Yeah, well, they're, 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 they're playing in, like, I think it might even be underway now. Uh, so that's just horrible for them. Um, but also, as well, just before we do move to NA, we are going to talk about some NA stuff. I want to bring up, perhaps, the, the game... The game of the day at 2200 CET, Fnatic are going to take on TSM on Mirage. So within the context of Gfinity, we've just seen Fnatic absolutely imperious again, marching onwards to another title. TSM stylistically are a great matchup for them. TSM almost feel like the Fnatic kryptonite. How do we see this one going? No, I mean, I agree with you. That's what makes TSM so tantalizing to me. I actually do think of all the teams at the moment, they they have the best chance to become the next number one team, like once they've got enough, enough results under their belt. But the main thing that's alluring to me was what always made me so confident Fnatic would always get back to that number one again and again and make these finals was that even if you could beat them once or you could have a good matchup against them, they always had a little something extra over the field as a whole. But actually, I agree. TSM at the moment feel like the first counter I've ever seen to Fnatic, like consistently on maps that Fnatic likes being able to beat Fnatic. And that's where today's match comes in because playing on Mirage, that used to be one where I could easily have said, right, okay, that's that's an obvious win for the Fnatic guys there. TSM can compete with them on it. They're always good on that map, but they're not going to beat them. But actually the last few times they've played Mirage, TSM's looked like they totally understand how to play Fnatic, how to throw Fnatic off, how to stop those Fnatic T sides that were so famous for shutting the game down. That doesn't happen against TSM. So I, I'm expecting TSM should win this match. Well, it's interesting because if we go on form just within the context of the league, rather than what we kind of feel, you know, in our gut feeling and recent LAN events, yeah. uh, it's, it's it's quite interesting, actually. So Fnatic have played 5-1-5. TSM have played 6-1-3, lost <coughs> 3. And, uh, and kind of poised in the middle of the pack. So I'll I'll, I'll tell you... Uh, what's been going on with TSM. So they lost to Titan, 16-12, on Inferno. Perhaps not a surprise, that is Titan's, you know, beast mode map. Yep. Uh, they have already, I think, played Fnatic in, in the group once before, which doesn't make sense, but that's what the results are saying here, uh, on Overpass and Lost. And then Virtus Pro uh, beat them 16-9 on Dust 2 as well. So a, a series of results there that seem out of sorts with what we know about TSM. Um, I, I, so I, I, I was, I'm inclined. I think this can be a game that they can absolutely win, but certainly current results suggest otherwise. 
Yeah, that's what's strange is that, yeah, I agree. Basically, it, the current form in this league alone would tell you TSM should lose, actually, because bizarrely, then they're not doing well, which, again, is totally out of character for TSM. No matter what problems they ever had online, they were always money online. In fact, the only thing joking, I used to say it jokingly, but I meant it seriously, the only thing that could stop TSM SM winning online competitions used to be getting DDoSed offline. Like, as long as yeah. that didn't happen, it felt like they would beat even teams who would have their number definitely online. Mm. And so I don't know if it's something to do with maybe the, the victories off, on, offline somehow are making it not as important online or they're having to get their heads in a new place or they've taken time off. That could also be something. But it's, it's very unusual to see TSM flounder this much because it's not that they're, they're not number one. They're like, what, fifth or sixth or something? That's, that's very unusual. Yeah. So, I mean, Here's the thing for anyone wanting to sort of get some uh, some quality picks in, I've got the uh, average numbers now um, for for the uh, team solo mid players, and again, this is obviously over a sample size of you know six games, so make of it what you will. Yeah. But uh, and obviously no, perhaps, these stats will improve as we go on with the future shows, so we'll have more info yeah. to go off. Yeah, well, I think we'll even get them flashing up for you and whatnot uh, when when Duncan's not wrecked out of his mind on the dankest weed that Amsterdam can provide. <laughs> um, but uh, no surprises here for you, Duncan. The guy who's got the highest average number of kills per game for TSM is Device, with 23 kills per average. No, I mean, that 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 is one thing that doesn't change, especially on online that's the thing i've always said this about device even before he got over the kind of lunge as a bit and started to get a bit more consistent in big matches is that he's the, he's a perfect example of how nerves really can wreck even the best player because when you looked online when the, listen a lot of these players they're not going to get nervous online maybe they would if it was an online final that might add in something but if it's just a group stage match they're going to play pretty much whatever their normal level of skill is and so a player like device should be basically having a feast in a league like this like he he does really well He's a guy who always performs online. He seems more, more at ease there. I mean, it's almost like the old joke of when we used to say about people who had problems at land. We used to say, like, I guess they have a really comfortable seat at home, you know, like that sort of a joke. Yeah. Usually people said it as if they were applying their hacking. But I actually think legitimately it's, it's almost the true in the case of device. It's more like he's just so at home. He's so comfortable that he can just play exactly what his level should be, you know. Mm. He's and, a great uh, bet always online, I'm sure. And here's the interesting thing. So... Who would you say would be second after Device in terms of average kills in TSM in this in this ESCA ESL Pro League? See, here's the thing: I would have to assume if I was thinking of like players in the team, well, it's probably like Cage and B, you know, like if I think of recent form. But I'm guessing from the way you're saying that, it's going to be some shock, like like something insane, like Zipnix is second or something, you know? Yep, there you go, bang on the money, mate. Well predicted. 19 kills uh, average per game which puts him ahead of Cajun, puts him ahead of Dupree, obviously puts him ahead of Carrigan, means he gets you an average of 28 points per match that he's in. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure he must be the cheapest this. salary in the team, you know. Him or Carrigan have to be the lowest. Yeah, yeah, he's the second lowest. The cheapest salary is Carrigan for 6800 For just $200 more, you can get Zipnix in your team, who's dropping 28 points so a game. It's great value. Yeah, I mean, that's... But, I mean, I'm really surprised by that because this is a player that... I don't know what it is. It never seems to... He's solid. He's reliable. I like him. Great 1.6 pedigree, but he never seems to do anything flashy for me. No, that's the thing. That's that's the best way to describe him. Uh, Zipnix is he's just reliable. That's actually what he kind of does in their team. He'll just play a certain spot well, or he'll play a bomb site well with someone else, like playing off them. But he's that's the thing in general. I'm I'm surprised his numbers are so good online. If it's a land game. He's never going to be the one I'm going to pick to carry, especially because there's so many good players in their team. Like they, they, they're also a team where they've now got to a point where they have like three players can carry. Only the in-game leaders getting all these kills. So he's literally last in the pecking order in that of what you'd expect in terms of mad frags. Mm. So yeah, it's going to be a real interesting battle for them. Before we move on to the NA region, let's just talk predictions then. So Fnatic okay. TSM on Mirage. Which way would you want to vote on this one? It's coming up. The game's going to start in, I think, 15 minutes. Yeah, see, that's the thing. You're actually right. Since the online form has been so good for Fnatic, mm. I don't know. Maybe I should put Maybe I should pick Fnatic there. Okay, I'll go with Fnatic to, to win this game. 
I mean, uh, uh, but haven't we talked about Fnatic, you know, and, and Mirage? Do we feel, like, do we feel, who, who's the better team technically on Mirage, would you say? See, that's the thing. In just pure analysis, if this is an offline game at the moment, I would give it to TSM. I think that actually, this interesting reason as to why Fnatic's going away from Mirage a bit, because I think that TSM is one of the teams that have kind of got their number on it, and they for them. So I actually think TSM's probably the better Mirage team right now, especially their T side has gotten really, really good on this map. It's not just winning on CT side. They have some great T tactics. So in, ter- in a purest sense, yeah, you should pick for TSM to win it. Mm. Okay, Just well, in terms of the form, I'm thinking for Nike at the moment. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's an interesting and tantalizing game. You'll be able to watch that in just 15 minutes. Uh, we're not, you know, you can have us on in the background, maybe, you know, definitely don't turn off from this, but also definitely watch that, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a quandary, these are the problems you find yourself in, yeah, but definitely watch this, because, yeah, you know, yeah. we don't want to have that awkward conversation after week one, the thing is, guys, you know, I just don't know how seriously you're taking this, Duncan was yeah, yeah. wrecked out of his mind in a cheap hotel <laughs> in the red light district of Amsterdam, Richard, you look like you've just come straight from the streets of uh, Detroit, and you just spent all this time talking about EU. You know, we're all about American money. Uh, sorry, this isn't going to work. So definitely watch this. Definitely keep watching this. But uh, talking about NA and money, boom. Look at that for a transition. Nice, sure. Like the chat was the chat was all great and everything, but, but we really need to go by the numbers and like the numbers are adding up right now. So could you maybe like, can I, I'm just going to need you to like get the numbers up and then I uh, oh, love, love the chat, love the chat. Yeah, great analysis, great analysis. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here we go. Let's talk about money and uh, American money and somebody else that spent big. It wasn't just Alpha Draft that, you know, coughed up the greenbacks to get us on board. Cloud9 obviously have spent big uh, and, you know, in bringing in their new look roster. So, you know, they've got, uh, you know, Skadoodle in there, big, big, uh, big signing. Um, Let's talk about this because they're going up against Keyed Stars. Uh, at 1 a.m. our time, so 2 a.m. Cent, uh, Central European time. And just looking at this run of results here that they've got, it's actually really surprising because overall, in terms of standings, Keyed Stars have played 5 won 5 They're on 15 points, just behind CLG in the NA region of the uh, Pro League. And Cloud9, by contrast, they played 3 won 3 and are down in the mid-table. So somebody's going to lose today. Somebody's going to, you know, forfeit the un- uh, the unbeaten records. Now, I'm surprised by how well Keyed Stars have been doing. Uh, perhaps I shouldn't be. Perhaps that's a little bit naive of me. I don't know. But is there any chance that Cloud9, coming off the back of a disappointing Gfinity, are going to get spanked by Keyed Stars? I think Keyed Stars can definitely beat them. The interesting thing, of what makes it so great to throw Keyed Stars into the mix of this kind of the NA side, even though from South America, obviously, is that it's not just the international flavor. It's that they are almost a team built to do well against NA teams because NA teams have all these great stuff. Listen, NA has talented players and they have dangerous players. They have explosive players. They have teams that if they get on a roll can run over you and just blow the game open. But what they don't really have so much of is like really good set strategies and players who have a role that they play consistently. And that's... So you're just breaking up a little bit again there, Duncan. So I'll just take uh, the, the, the lead on this. Uh, just looking at the salaries and everything on the player... Uh, player list that you've got. It's quite interesting because uh, this team, um, I, I've known some of these players from CSS. Obviously, Fallen did come over and play in, in, in Counter-Strike Source quite famously for a little bit and caused an apoplexy amongst 1.6 fans when he said, as far as he was concerned, Counter-Strike Source was the more tactical game. Um, so, yeah, he lost, actually, a lot of his fan base for that. And it's interesting to see him uh, put so high in in the uh, the salary. I mean, I guess that's a little bit of uh, you know your name uh, kind of pre- you know preceding you because this is a guy who, yeah, he's 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 very very good uh, in terms of orping. But there's people on the team that actually do a lot better. 
Like, for example, uh, Fair uh, or Fur, however you pronounce it, he is the guy that's doing the damage for Keen Stars. This is a guy who has got an average of 26 kills a game. That an, equates to an average of 43 points per game as things stand. This guy is the guy you really want in the team. Uh, you know, he's the consistent one. You can see he's right up there quite high. But he is the guy that is guaranteed. Fallen's been a little bit inconsistent. He's had some good games. He's had some not so good games. But 43 points average is one of the highest in the region. So Fair right now looks like a very good pick. He looks like he's worth the money. If you wanted to go stealth and be a little bit budget, a little bit under, you know, kind of under the radar, um, a guy that I knew from back in, you know, uh, uh, the CSS day days was Steel. And Steel is actually doing very well at the moment. He's getting 25 points average per game, 19 kills average, and is obviously a little bit cheaper. So there are players in, you know, 7,300, not, not, not a massive amount of money, you know, second lowest on the team, yet he's putting up pretty impressive numbers. So he's Am somebody that... Alive? Yeah, you are. You're back here. Okay. So yeah, no, I, agree, so, so, I agree with you on that, by the way. From what I've seen of the games where they had upsets, sorry, he was actually the best player on the team still. Like, even though Fallen has the 1.6 pedigree, he's more of just the in-game leader in this team. I, can't, I don't know where I cut off, but that's kind of what I was getting to. Mm. Like, the main thing, I think, for their team is they have really good tactics. And for the North American team, where that's more of a weakness than the region, I think that's actually a really high quality to have. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. So I, I'm I'm impressed with this team. I mean, I, first of all, I think it's great to see a Brazilian team, you know, being able to compete in this league regularly. Uh, I saw recently that, you know, there was some talks, would they be going to I buy power or something like that because they were given some PCs. That obviously was just a kind of, you know, sponsorship deal, I think it was. Nothing, anything to get too excited about. But uh, th th this is a side that, you know, on current form, on results... They'll be right up there come the end of the season, I think. You know, there's actually so many sort of weak teams in the NA region. You can back Keith Stars to be right up there with the elite. Now, to, to change pace and talk about Cloud9 for a moment, Cloud9 are in a little bit of a, a little bit of a funk, you know, a little bit of a quandary. They just changed, you know, re uh, rosters recently. We all know about the brouhaha uh, surrounding that. They've got themselves... Uh, you know, a, a great team on paper, but so far really failing to deliver on that promise. Um, they looked out of sorts at Gfinity and communication problems. They got very, I don't want to use the word upset, but they certainly didn't enjoy some of the things that we said about them in the analysis room, you know, talking about maybe they didn't have, a, and again, I didn't say this, but, you know, I think Scoots talked about, you know, does money lead to a lack of motivation? And they made a point of saying, we're motivated. We're trying harder than anybody else right now. We really want to win. So could there be like some sort of mental block going into this game? I mean, I guess if you're going to prove that you are the real deal, this is the game you want to win. I mean, to be fair, that actually brings up a... Kind of a... A metaphor that people often say there's a famous quote that says something richard like like a liar is never so obvious as when he's indignant because the idea is someone who lies all the time if the, then one time they tell the truth you don't believe them and they're like no no i'm really telling the truth like, like it shows that the other times they were kind of like selling you something you know so here's the thing i'd ask cloud nine that's all well people have always said you guys just play for the money and you're the streaming guys and you've got the big names you don't really care that much about winning well you never were this indignant before you're never that mad before so listen i could believe it maybe this team is like we're going all in this time and there's no excuses and we're going to go for the top I could, that could be true, but it also kind of betrays that, listen, you can't blame other people for thinking otherwise, because that's, that feels like what the other teams were like previously for the last six months. So we're, you have to kind of show us. Don't just tell us, oh, we're trying really hard. We'll, we'll wait to see some change in results. Then, we'll, then I'm sure we'll all be on board and want to see them do well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I want to say in terms of picks, you know, if you were to pick teams here, I'm amazed Freakazoid is so low in terms of salary. Because this is the guy who's going to be on the point man for the team. This is the guy who is going to be out there entry fragging. And what we saw at Gfinity was, I think he top fragged on like three halves or, or uh, might have been in total on three maps. I can't remember the exact statistic. But for 6,400, 
I think that's a bargain. I think this is a guy that will actually post big numbers for the team, especially in a region where, let's be honest, he's going to be coming up against weak teams week in, week out. No, he was a guy who actually did pretty decently at the land. Like, I wouldn't really blame him because, especially considering I, I knew he was only just coming back at a competitive, it's his first big land. He, he hasn't played in all these big, big lands recently. In- that even some of the other NA players have. So I thought he he performed entirely serviceably. And like you're saying, within the NA region, since he's not someone who's probably even going to be highly desired, it's probably is a good pickup, actually. Yeah. I'm sure so there's think, other bigger names that'd be that would be much more expensive that wouldn't give you the same value. Yeah, and, and equally as well, like the one thing we know about Skadoodle from his time playing, this is a guy who would always wreck the weaker teams. Like he was very, very good in the big games. That isn't it's not to say he just you know kills the minnows and, and, and can't do it against the big teams. But when he played weaker teams, he would absolutely destroy them. You know, 30s left left, right, and center. This was a a, a fragging orper. So again, uh for, to see him below Shroud in terms of salary. When I think Shroud's been one of the ongoing disappointments within Cloud9 after he had that huge ESL cologne where he was like, wow, where did they find this kid? Um, I, I would say Skadoodle at that money is a pretty good pickup as well. Yeah, the funny thing is, I mean, I, admittedly, maybe this statistically is based on the fact The whole banning issue was going on. He was looking for a team, so maybe that's taken into account in terms of how they do the algorithm or whatever to get to get the, the overall salary number. Mm. But when I look at their team, I think of my big number. I like. I'm gonna have the frag movie now. Yeah, I I I I picked up bits of that. You you were you were chopping up again, but I I I think the gist of it is, you know, I I, I know that Shroud obviously uh, online has been uh, a player that you know has been, you know, one of the more consistent players for them. But internationally, I I think he's been missing a little bit. So that's kind of what I'm basing my comments on. Uh, perhaps. Perhaps domestically in this league for three for three hundred dollars more in terms of salary, he might be a very good pick because obviously he can be a you know super accomplished player. I just feel that if I was if I was putting someone on my team, I'd probably draft Skadoodle over Shroud. I think I feel like he's more of a a known quantity in the sense that you know because he's an Orpa he, and a very good one at that, and I would say has the potential to be the strongest Orpa in the region. This is a guy who I I think will you know, go on to post big numbers. He's always going to have an impact on a game. Um, just to bring it back to what we were talking about, let's try and get a prediction then. I mean, Cloud9 versus Keyed Stars, it's going to be on Dust2. How do you see that one going? Hmm. Yeah, Dust2 all think should be a D. The problem with I a dust two my four and I know an author the biggest and I would assume this is a map where Skadoodle should be able to have a huge impact. Mm. Okay, I mean I I I, I don't know I, I I think that's from what I remember about because I haven't even watched Keith Stars play this season so I I definitely won't lie about that uh, my my sort of principal concern has been you know the international events and. Haven't I haven't had the pleasure of watching Keyed Stars play, but what I do know about them collectively as a group, they were all huge uh, Dust Two players. That was like one of their best maps back in previous uh, lineups uh, when they were coming over to events like Copenhagen Games and stuff. They were very very good on that. Fallen in particularly always tends to have a good time on that map. So I don't know. I I could I can definitely see Keyed Stars taking that one. I don't think they've lost on Dust Two. Uh, in in this league, which again we're not talking about a massive sample size here, but uh, yeah, I, I absolutely feel that uh, you can probably put a safe bet on Keyed Stars here, especially with Cloud Nine probably feeling a little bit burnt out from their sort of international endeavours. Well, yeah, fair enough. Mm. So I, mean, I uh, think that should be a competitive match at least because those are two teams that should actually be contending to maybe even be the best in the region. Mm. 
So just to uh, look at the other games that are coming up in the NA region, this is going to be played, uh, you know, t t tomorrow, uh, obviously on our time. Um, we we've got uh, Cloud9 will be taking on Method, who I, I feel that should be an easy win for them, right? Method have only won once from six played. Yeah, they're, they're not a team that w you should have a great amount of expectation for. Mm. Um, uh I mean, they, they, they did get eight rounds against CLG. Uh, they're a, a team where I can look at the lineup and I legitimately have never seen any of these players before. Mm. Yeah, but that's also a CLG that's like itself got roster issues and they're still figuring things out. So I, I don't know how much that will actually indicate going forwards. And if you wanted to get a, a, a cheap player there who's actually not been doing too bad uh, from Method, I've, I've got him here, actually. Let me just... I, did, I was looking at the numbers before. And uh, it's Is interesting... It just or something yeah no St uh, Strebor Strebor is way out in front uh, f for them is is KDA okay. is like the highest uh, by some distance you know like where everyone else is like getting 0 0.5 0 0.6 0 0.8 he's like got uh, I think it's like a 1.2 uh, on oh. average um, and has actually had some big games I think against CLG yeah, he managed to do okay. That was yeah, that was one point two against CLG, but some of the the games they've had against lesser oppositions, he's hit as high as one point six. So you can see that street ball there. I mean, whether I'd want to pay six thousand eight hundred to have him in, you know, I probably wouldn't go that far. But uh, he's he he's the guy that actually is you know considering he's the middle of the pack for the team, he's the guy who's like actually statistically their strongest player by quite some distance. Uh, the other game we've got... But actually, that's in... one of the things oh, about the ESEA League. In terms of global effect, is that I feel as though a lot of the NA teams... I mean, I know I only watch the big lands and some of the online competitions, so I, did, I don't know a lot of these teams in, in the, like the bottom three to four teams. Some of those players I've never heard of. Mm. So... Despite not having a bit there's uh again because you're breaking up, I'll cut on to the next uh, couple of NA fixtures that are going to be coming up, and then may maybe we kill the show till we can get you out of Amsterdam, extract you, and bring you back yeah. to the back to the promised get the land. Chopper. Yeah, get the chopper. And and uh, hopefully you'll be able. You won't think it's a hallucination, and you'll actually know to to to, to grab onto the ladder. Uh, we've got Tempo Storm playing Affinity, so that's going to be at four a.m. Central European time for our Euro fans. I don't know. Obviously, it depends on what time zone you are in America. I'm not even going to get into that. Your country's crazy and 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 too big and frightening to me. Um, what can you tell me about this Tempo Storm lineup? Because you know, that's a pretty big name in other games, uh, Hearthstone in particular. But, uh, you know, they're, they're looking to enter into CSGO and make a name for themselves. Currently played five, won two, lost three. Uh, is there any players on there that you think, you know, yeah, th th they could be a surprise package? Um, let me think. The thing is, I'm, lo I'm just looking at the names now. This team actually has some players who... Uh, one of their players, Slip, used to be in a lineup that was called UMX at the end of 1.6. And they actually went to like an E-Star Soul. Like they were getting to the level of being like maybe the third best NA team. So he was actually a decent player. I'm not sure what's happened to him since then. I think RYX was a decent player as well around this time. So it's not that they have totally unknown pedigree. It's just more the fact that if you look at their recent results, they're not very good in the league overall. Like They, have, they had a couple of wins, but... Um, I think they, it's it's pretty obvious they should remain a bottom feeder. But like you're saying, the team they're playing against isn't a super well-known team either. So I'd assume it would be reasonably close. Yeah, um, I, 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 I could definitely see it going either way. I mean, obviously, like you say, Affinity are no slouches themselves. Um, but I'm, I'm, I want to see more of this Tempo Storm because I know it was out there for the longest period of time. Like Tempo Storm was saying, oh, we're coming in to see us go. We're coming in to see us go. You know, watch out. We're going to, you know, turn a few heads. And, you know, it hasn't gone like that at all so far. So I'm definitely intrigued to see if they can, you know, be up there come the end of the season. I think it's going to be a slog because 
there's quite a distinct line in the NA group in particular. Like I would say it's far easier to read than the European group. Like basically, you know, CLG, if you look at the standings, it's CLG, Keen Stars, Luminosity, Liquid, Nihilum, Elevate, Cloud9, Tempo Storm, Ace Method, Mouse Spaz, Affinity. You know, you can see straight away where the cutoff point in actual caliber is. Which, no, uh, in, is it- in NA, there's almost like a quality cutoff, you know, where if a team yeah. is below that, who's a top team, someone's wrong. Whereas the difference is in EU, sometimes some of the, that's why I don't go crazy at the moment early on, because some of the teams in EU, it could just be schedule. Like if they had the wrong opponent, that's like a stylistic mismatch. And that's why they're, they're not looking so good now, but they might have three opponents coming up that are good teams, but they're going to beat them. So I think in NA, it's more like, it's more of a barometer just for how the top teams are doing at the moment, at least until the region develops a bit more. Hmm. Uh, and, and this is what I mean. Leagues like this will definitely help the region develop. But in terms of you guys who are going to be signing up and drafting players, probably is a smart idea to avoid that bottom half uh, of the NA region if you're putting people into your fantasy team. Because, sure, they'll, when they're playing each other, you might get some big results. But the, the, the knack to uh, fantasy drafting isn't just about game wins. What you want is you want long games where there's like ridiculous amounts of fragging going on, ridiculous amounts of defuses going on. And of course, these weaker teams are less likely to be involved in those games because they're just going to get spanked. And that's going to be the end of that. You know, they're the, they're the guys who lose 16-2, 16-4, you know, 16-6 when they come up against the top teams. So something to think about there as you move forward. Uh, final match I think we'll take a look at just from... Uh, from um na uh, interestingly enough is going to be team liquid in action as well uh which will be at 5 a.m if you're a night owl in europe um and they'll be playing uh, i'm calling them affinity it is actually affinity which I'm, I'm guessing i have to pronounce the n as affinity which i don't know why a team would do that uh it's just that's poor marketing as i see it but uh but anyway we we, we did see team liquid uh, playing at uh, Gfinity, and we uh, we didn't have a lot of good things to say about them, even though they took a map uh, of some of the you know more established European teams. We were really critical of uh, Team Liquid overall, and this is a league I think realistically they need to be looking at performing very well. They're currently sat in fourth spot. They've won four, lost two. Affinity, Affinity are rock bottom with zero. So. Uh, <laughs> How do, how do we see that one going? I mean, that's got to be an easy win for Liquid, surely. It should be. That's the thing. Even though they've had the issues in Europe at those lands, and maybe some of that is nerves-related or people just can't perform to the level they, they, they should be capable of, at home, online, I feel like this should be a team. Like, actually, they should be able to build their rep up a bit more when, they do, when they're back home and make up a little bit for some of those, those failings overseas. So I would assume this should be a, a Liquid win. There's too much talent in that lineup. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll talk about it statistically. Uh, there's a player for Affinity called Abe. He's available, I think, for the salary. It says here on my spreadsheet, 6,100. I don't know if that's changed. But uh, that, that's actually, considering the numbers he's posting, that could be a steal. Again, I, I, I know I've just said maybe you shouldn't necessarily go in for it. Uh, but this could be someone worth thinking about. He gets 22 points on average, an average of 16 kills a game. 6,100 is one of the cheaper salaries out there. So definitely uh, definitely could be someone worth thinking about if you need to fill in a gap once you've picked you know, your team of stars. Uh, so he, he's somebody who's clearly been doing damage, and he's like the second lowest salary in the team. Uh, in terms of Liquid, I'll just have a look and see if we've got them here. I'm sure I've got some stats for them somewhere. I wanted to see how Adrian was doing in particular. So Adrian's had... Uh, some games where it's not they you know as, as perhaps expected the re- the points he's been getting haven't been the best so looking at Adrian yeah he's he's actually posting he posted 12 points there 12 points there so yeah he's getting an average of about 12 points per game which is really poor but that actually is in line with what we saw uh, with his performances at uh, at, at Gfinity where he was constantly buying an orb but wasn't killing anyone with the orb, like, at all. Yeah, it feels like he's in some sort of crisis in his career because, I mean, he's the in-game leader. He obviously has a big impact. It feels like he's tied into the organization. Like they want to have him as a key piece because some of the others aren't experienced. 
But unless the others can get phenomenal and make it like an existence type scenario where we can overlook it because the team's so good, it, people are going to again and again come back to this, rightfully so, and go, his performance is lacking for the level of team and kind of resources the team has. And so I do feel as though at the moment, this, it feels like this is the biggest slump of his career. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And again, you know, I talked about it a lot during Gfinity. This is not the Adrian I'm used to seeing. Like back when he was in Team Dynamic, he was a monster. Like him and AZK were absolute beasts. You know, you would you would be talking about which one of them was the star player from sort of week to week. You know, and that lineup was Adrian, AZK, Steel, Legend, and Pex, the man with the shaky aim. Now that that team were ridiculous. They were like r really, really good. But that was predicated on Adrian and AZK just being absolute beasts. Uh, for him to be playing like this in CSGO, I just, it's a shock to me. It really is. Because like, what I was, when, when uh, Team Liquid, this roster was announced, I was like, right, this is it. Adrian's going to be sick on this team. It's great to see him get this, like, you know, second opportunity to be part of what could be an amazing side. He'll be a carry a carrier bag. He'll be like the guy who's no 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 none of that's come true. He's been he's been really really shockingly poor for him. So I agree, it could be some sort of crisis. And uh, people are making an interesting point here as well about Elish having that like ridiculously high salary. Uh, well, I say ridiculously. I mean, maybe I, maybe I can't say that. But I think that's like really, really high based on what, what we've seen. I know he's a decent player, but yeah, know, yeah, Rich, I, I agree. His salary is way too high. I mean, there's players in Eastern Europe who go, oh, oh, you meant an alpha draft, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what I meant as well, Rich. Yeah, yeah. Just, as if the mic <laughs> cuts back in just for that. The banter. Like, yeah, the banter, unreal. Yeah, yeah well, they'll, they'll probably <laughs> scrub that out of the vod if indeed they make a vod of this at okay. all. But uh, but yeah, yeah, the, the salary. Is I think that's really high. I think that's like really, really high for for Alish. I do you disagree. Do you think that you know that, that he's worth that kind of money? No, that is just just in terms of the numbers. That's probably a bit too high. I mean, he's a player who can put up some numbers online, but I, I wouldn't expect to be that sort of level because when you spend that much, that's supposed to be your main best player. You know. Yeah. I well, it's got to be at least a known quantity. You've got to be getting something for that. I'd be more inclined to scale it down a little bit and take a gamble on Nitro for eight hundred dollars less. Especially his style of play, I'd assume he'll he should get the numbers more. Mm. Yeah, I, or, yeah, I agree. I mean, let's not forget. I I still think Nitro is like almost like the forgotten man of NA uh, in a lot of ways. You know, this is a guy who was in the iPad Power lineup. This is a guy who uh, you know got 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 dropped for Hiko when they made that super team before the whole NA match fixing debacle came tumbling down and just scorched the earth. But Nitro was like the guy that everyone was like, yeah, you know, this, this guy's going to be great. He's going to be an awesome player. And I think I think he's languishing a little bit right now. I think he's capable of better things. Uh, whether whether that'll happen anytime soon, I don't know. But I'd be certainly inclined to to back him, uh, you know, over, over over any other players in that particular roster. Agreed. Good. I'm glad, glad we're agreed. So we've talked about this play day. Um, and, and, and we've highlighted some of the fixtures. Given that this uh, this podcast has been a little bit like Vietnam, you know, we just need to get out of it and survive. We'll always remember it. It'll always be traumatic. Our first ever Alpha Draft event where, you know, Duncan, Duncan just the, the, wasn't with it 100% of the time. Richard had to deal with robot voice, awkward silences, somehow keep the show going, which, you know, we've done. We've done immensely. I'm sure we'll refine as we move forward, but we should probably kill it dead here and just yeah. about do better and never speak of episode one again. Yeah, listen, we'll we'll follow the numbers, guys. We'll improve those numbers, and then we'll see you again on another episode of By the Numbers. <laughs> yeah, you're not doing the outro. I'm the host. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to remember okay. as well. Like, what, wait, so what people don't realize is when we had the initial creative meetings about this, they came in and they were like, "So, who's going to host the show?" And Duncan was like, yeah, I nominate Richard for that job. Uh, I just, you know, I think he's better at it. And I need to really concentrate on all my statistical analysis. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We throw Richard under the bus. Fuck him. So, at least let me do, at least let me do okay, this. Okay. Uh, 
but which I have no idea what it's going to be. Oh, actually, before we do do the sign off, let's talk about the other show that Alpha Draft are doing, which is about League of Legends, which is going to have you and Monte Cristo on it. Why don't we talk about that? And I don't know what the, the name of that one is, but yeah, basically we'll have a show for League of Legends where likewise we'll try and have, like, obviously we're shaping the focus of this show we're doing in CSGO, but it'll be something similar. Like we'll try and weave narrative around the stats and figure out who's a good buy, who's not. Obviously that one will be with Monty. So that one has the potential to be interesting in a, in a, a unique way to our show here where it's me and you. So I'm not sure how that one will go yet. Cause I'll have to host that one. Sadly, I I'll actually be forced <laughs> to be responsible, but for all these shows, honest guys, we'll have a webcam. It'll be turned on. I'll actually be able to speak coherently without cutting out. It'll be just like 2015. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to tuning in for that, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to counting the cash uh, that you get paid for. for that that for could be it. a good name for it, I reckon, because it is a fantasy game, you know, maybe counting the cash with Thorne counting and the Matty, cash. Monte Cristo. If I get a percentage point coming up with the name, I'm in. Uh, you can use it. But if not, I, I might have to okay. save that one for some sort of my, my own show. Once my credibility has been shot to pieces. Uh, so there we go. Look, uh, thanks for all your input, Duncan. It's always a pleasure. I'm sure we are going to be out cruising the uh, the sites of uh, Amsterdam. There's, there's Rembrandt, right? You can check that yeah, out. Yeah, 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 exactly. It, there's, it, like, it's the way the light shines off the, the red paintings of Rembrandt that actually really kind of gets me going, Rich. Yeah, and, and and Van Van Gogh as well. You got the, yeah. it's, there's it's a whole a district of great art in uh, in Amsterdam. Yeah, it's a, it's a city of culture, and uh, I, I I hope you enjoy it. Looking forward to seeing you back next week, refreshed from your uh, excursions. But uh, there we go. So just that's going to be the concept each week. We're going to sort of be pulling out some stats, telling you what you need to draft. If you haven't signed up an Alpha Draft account, uh, it's dead easy to do. You go alphadraft.com. You go there, you register, and then you can start playing. You put your players in, you can get involved anytime, and uh, you have the chance to win big money for doing it. And remember, it's not gambling, so Sir Scoots can keep his wig on. It's a game of skill. It's a game of skill, as, as termed by the American government. So don't call it betting. We're not into that. It's a game of skill. Uh, we're going to help you get good at that game if you keep watching us week in, week out. But for now, we're going to go away, go back to the drawing board, come back a little bit better next week. Thanks a lot for watching. I've been Richard Lewis. This has been By The Numbers. Peace.